but this is a family. Now, some of y'all might be incestuous around here, but this is a family. One person eat, we all eat. Now, some people might not eat as much, but they're still going to eat. We back in front of the camera today, y'all. I got to sell some stuff. Go on over there to uptopbeauty.com and check out my super fly shades. I got them in beige and black. Now, let's get into this Mary Wells book. Considering that her first song for Motown was a hit and that in four years she had risen from number 41 to number one on the pop charts, it's not surprising she felt this way. Mary saw herself not only as the girl who beat the Beatles, but the woman who made Motown a success. As Wells told Steve Bergsman, the details of her Motown career, a theme kept reoccurring. I don't think I ever got the recognition I should have gotten, Wells said of her first recorded song, Bye Bye Baby. When Bergsman quoted, from a publication about the giant publicity effort Motown was putting behind her career, Mary responded, It looks like they were doing a lot, but you're talking about in spaces, spurts, not done right behind each other. You talk about maybe doing the Dick Clark show, then about five months later you do a magazine article, and that might be in just Denver. People didn't have a lot to read about me in the early days, she continued, and they still don't. Motown didn't have too much money, so they didn't put out a lot of publicity on me. Indeed, news clips are sparse from the early days of Wells' career. This may be partly because white-owned and white-staffed newspapers in the pre-civil rights days weren't particularly interested in writing about black music, at least not before Motown has succeeded in making such music a mainstream concern. But it also was Motown's fault. Company insiders say the young company failed to concentrate on and professionalize its public relations operation until the end of 1964. As soon as the decision was made, the company began issuing a blizzard of press releases and soon scored a major coup by arranging for Wells to be a guest on the Steve Allen Show on May 29th, 1964. Ironically, Wells' appearance was a telling indicator of the company's previous PR deficiencies. Wells gave a shout out to the other artists at Motown, Little Stevie Wonder, Smokey Robinson, uh, the, and the Miracles, some other people, blah, blah, blah. And the audience was like, who the hell is that? When she mentioned Little Stevie Wonder, the audience roared with laughter. When she mentioned Smokey Robinson and the Miracle, the people laughed again. They very likely had never heard of these acts and thought the names were funny. Murray kept her cool and merely remarked to Alan and the audience that they would be hearing from these groups later on. So that definitely does explain why there is not a lot about Murray Wells out there. You know, and maybe that's part of the reason why she's not really acknowledged as a Motown superstar, as Motown's first superstar, because it wasn't a lot of press out there about her. When Murray would tell Motown executives she thought she deserved more money for a particular hit record, she said they would tell her that her record only sold 500,000 copies. That, she said, was totally ridiculous. Remember, but Motown was bullshitting its artists on what was really going on. They was passing out gold records, not because the artists earned them, but because they just wanted to encourage the artists. The R-I-A-A, -A, I forgot what that is an acronym for, but the people who actually kept record of how many records were sold we're not doing the numbers at Motown. Motown didn't sign up for that. So Motown decided to give their people their own 
gold records, platinum records. Uh, uh, uh. When Motown executives told Wells that this was truly the number of records sold, she thought they were lying. It made me feel very inferior and made me feel like I was being used and abused, she said. The result of her stay at Motown, Mary asserted, was that I owed the company money for being its major female star. Ironically and possibly fueling the singer's emotions, Motown tried to calm Mary the same way that some white-owned record companies handled their black artists. They'd give me a new car and expect me to be grateful. Remember when they did that to Florence Ballard? Okay, bitch, we gave you a rotten deal, but here go a brand new Cadillac. From the company. They give me a new car and expected me to be grateful, well said. Motown executives also made much of the fact that they had given her a $500 mink stole for her 21st birthday in 1964. To Wells, it seemed especially unfair that while her own career at Motown had started with a hit record, Motown had supported the Supremes until the group for years called the No Hit Supremes finally made the big time with their 10th record. Where did I love go? When you are an artist at the earlier Motown, you are a family. This is a co-op. A HOA. That means you put your money in a pot like taxes and the money is distributed accordingly. Your money is to maintain this machine. Now I realize that your sisters, the Supremes, aren't bringing in money like that, but they still are a contributing factor to the machine that is Motown. So I'm sorry. That it's like this for you, but this is a family. Now, some of y'all might be incestuous around here, but this is a family. If one person eat, we all eat. Now, some people might not eat as much, but they're still going to eat. So, I get it. In the end, to the dismay of most people who cared about her, Mary concluded that she needed to leave Motown and go out on her own as a recording artist. In hindsight, she was wrong. At the time, the only person inside or outside of Motown who is known to have agreed with her was Herman Griffin, her ex-husband, who doubtless saw himself making big money as the manager of an independent superstar. Eddie Holland told Unsung that Herman was the key to Mary's leaving, and his brother Brian called Herman the spin golly behind Mary's departure. Brenda Holloway also attributed Wells' determination to leave Motown to Herman's guidance. Holloway expressed astonishment at Mary's lifelong tendency to be unduly influenced not only by Griffin, but by the opinion of her other lovers, husbands and boyfriends. According to Holloway, women are easily led when they don't have a father in their life. Esther Gordy Edwards said Wells would have done better by staying in Motown. I think she would have been a super, superstar if she had stayed. Motown songwriter Mickey Gentile was even more blunt. If Mary had stayed in Motown, he told Unsung, she would have been Diana Ross. Now, I don't know about that. In fact, Murray told Steve Bergsman that after she began formal negotiations in 1964 to leave Motown, Gordy offered her 50% of the company if she would stay. <laughs> and I turned it down. She said, because I was very hurt. I felt, felt like, why should we have to go through all of these changes, mental changes, pain changes, in order for him to do something towards me that was right? Uh, uh, Murray Wells, he even gave Sugar Ray, his wife that sold the vagina for him out there on the strip, 50% of the company. He wouldn't even do that for Diana Ross. Ooh, I know that thing is beating her up mentally now. Well, then. So I said to him, forget 50%. I just want out. I can't deal with it any longer. She earlier had told the same story to her friends who were aghast to hear that she had not considered the offer to half 
of a rising record company. If she was telling the truth, it would have meant not only that she could practically have written her own contract, but also that all artists who became successful at the company, whether she had anything to do with them or not, would have poured money into half owner Wells's pocket just as they were pouring it into Gordy's. You would have had a stake in Diana Ross, trying years later to defend her decision to abandon Motown, Mary told interviewer Randy Russie. She had believed that because she had made such a big fuss about wanting to leave, the company would have found a way to punish her, possibly by not releasing stuff, records she had recorded. <sighs> She just, in that point right there, I, I understand the confusion. I really do. Well's change of heart occurred after she got to know firsthand how tough it was for her to survive without Motown. In an interview in the 1980s, she said, if I had been more on top of knowing more about the inside of the business, I probably wouldn't have left. I probably wouldn't have been as sensitive and as emotional about the situation. In 1983, she bluntly told a reporter for the Michigan Chronicle, I should have stayed with Motown. On May 13th, when my guy was riding high in the Billboard Top 40, Motown threw Wells a fabulous 21st birthday party, attended by all Motown big shots. The highlight of the party came when Gordy presented Wells, the company's biggest star, with a mink stole. Just one week before the party, Wells had recorded the ironically tuned When I'm Gone in Motown's studio. Sometime after the party, Mickey Stevenson told Gordy he heard that Griffin was telling Wells and others that she was being treated badly at Motown. Gordy immediately telephoned Wells and asked her to meet with him in his office. She asked Gordy to come to her apartment, number four, at 3320 West Chicago Boulevard, and he dutifully went over there. After some small talk, Gordy asked Wells if she was unhappy about anything. He had a lot at stake. The three-year contract Mary had signed in July 1960 already had been unilaterally extended by Gordy, as was his right under its terms for another three years. But under Michigan law, because Mary had been a minor when she signed the original contract, she had the right to disaffirm it when she turned 21. According to Gordy's autobiography, To Be Loved, after he asked his question, Wells looked at him as if she felt sorry for him. Understandably, he thought this was a bad sign. Then she told him she wanted him to talk to her lawyer, a New York attorney named Louis Harris, who would visit him at his office the next day. Gordy thought this was an even worse sign. Wells' account of the meeting, as told to Steve Bergsman, is that Gordy came to her apartment and talked to me about why I didn't want to come back to the company, she said, she told him. I enjoyed singing, but I could go to church and sing for free. Attorney Harris duly arrived at Gordy's office the next day, June 17th, and told him that Wells, now 21 for more than one month, wanted to disaffirm her contract with Motown. When Gordy asked him why, Harris said Wells could get a better deal with another company. Ooh, he told you! <laughs>